Um, welcome everyone to our quarterly embedded panel. This is a really great um, panel we have. As, as always, we've got an um, amazing topic to cover as well. And so we're going to dive right into it. Um, to kick us off, Alicia is going to um, just describe what the topic is for today's panel. We are going to talk about from concept to launch, uh, what it takes to build and ship a product. This is all the software that you maybe forgot to write, the manufacturing software, a little bit of the cloud software that interfaces with your device. Um, I'm excited to have Tyler and Philip join me because they're going to be experts in this area as well. So those things you forgot to do, this is, this is the new list. Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to go through a quick round of introductions, although uh, for folks who are joining us from previous sessions, they'll probably know these faces. Have we got anyone today? Um, Alicia, do you want to um, introduce yourself first? Sure. My name is Alicia White. I host the Embedded podcast, where we talk about all sorts of embedded topics, mostly with guests, and we find out maybe more about people than technology. I also have Logical Elegance uh, as a consulting firm that I run with my partner. And I wrote a book uh, called Making Embedded Systems from O'Reilly. And I have taught a class by the same name um, for Classpert. So yes, this, this, is, this is where I live. This is my field. Amazing. Yeah, Embedded FM is like one of my favorite of all time podcasts. So um, yeah, it's great to have you here today. Um, Phil, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Phil Johnston. I'm the founder of Embedded Artistry. Um, I'm an embedded systems consultant and educator. And, you know, I've been doing this for about 13 years now, and I've shipped uh, a lot of products in that time. So I've uh, seen and experienced all the things you forget about multiple times. So it'll be fun to get into that with this crew. Awesome. And Tyler, could you introduce yourself? Of course. Yeah, I'm Tyler, uh, one of the co-founders of Memfault. I'm not a consultant, full-time employee over here. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I got my start in firmware at a company called Pebble. We were making smartwatches, uh, had a few mil or a couple of million of those in the field, and I just found myself constantly working on tools and then doubled down on that at Fitbit when I was a firmware engineer there. I was building a lot of tools. <laughs> so a lot of the things that we'll be talking about here, you know, did some work on the firmware, of course, as a firmware engineer, but but it was not my focus. And so I'm excited to talk to the group here. Noah, do you get to introduce yourself too? <laughs> sure, why not? Uh, my name is Noah Pendleton. I'm uh, moderating today's discussion, so you won't hear too much from me. Lucky for you guys. Um, yeah, I'm a firmware engineer by trade, so I've been doing it a long time. I'm currently an employee at Memphis, working with Tyler every day, which is um, basically a dream come true. So it's been a, a good a good uh, career for me so far. All right. Um, well, thanks everyone for in introductions. Um, let's dive into our first group question. So um, just a little bit of background on this format um, for folks who are joining us for the first time. We do a couple of group questions and a couple of individual questions just to keep the discussion flowing. Um, and yeah, I keep those Q and A is coming in as well. Um, super, super fun for us to answer those questions from you. All right, so uh, first group question for us is, we're gonna talk about some fundamentals and um, this sort of background in shipping an IoT product. So the question is, what pieces need to be in place when you want to have your device being ready for release to manufacturing? So one of the things that, I mean, this of course, like you need a rock solid bootloader. You need a way to update your devices. Like if you're even thinking about getting into manufacturing and you have to have the ability to fix things like you have to have a bootloader you have to have an ota um and then my favorite thing as as well as like we go through manufacturing and, and leading up to it and have bugs and, and have bugs in the file system or other various things i always kind of strive to have a factory reset i think we we kind of didn't do factory reset correctly on maybe like pebble v1 but on v2 and v3 it was like the most reliable most robust it cleared almost everything <laughs> um, there was no usage of, of any sort of file system or anything that could be corrupted it was like the most brutal fa factory set but it was the thing that saved us probably many many times at the end of the day and so those are a couple of my recommendations i guess a few but... i would say you need to have manufacturing software the difference between making one prototype or 10 engineering prototypes and the making a thousand or a million is huge. You can't just fix it on your desk anymore. You have to make it so that someone else 
can program it, can test it, can make sure the hardware is good, uh, and then do all of the things that we're going to talk about with respect to does this unit connect to the right cloud? Uh, so there's a lot more that goes on. I think I'll throw in a maybe something even more fundamental. You know, before you start manufacturing your devices, you really need to have a, a clear idea of what done looks like for your system. And you really want to be there. You don't want to do what I've seen so many times, which is, you know, we're we're really rushing forward on producing the hardware so we can, you know, make our September deadline to start producing units so we can be in stores by Christmas. But then your software team's actually another six or eight months out. So all you're doing is spending money to put things in a warehouse and um, you know, you could have used that time refining your hardware or figuring out, uh, you know, various problems that you're you're just kind of glossing over because you wanted to to start producing units, you know, as early as possible. But that's how we get as customers devices that as soon as you open them, you have to update their firmware, maybe three or four times. Right. Which I don't enjoy. <laughs> no. It's probably my least favorite part about buying a new product. It's not a good customer look. The, the thing that I hear so many people forget about with manufacturing in general is that there's no internet connection or very little internet connection in the factory itself. And so we've had a number of customers that are like, oh, our device requires that we contact the server or even maybe from the beginning, their debug flow requires an LTE connection or a cloud component and they don't actually build the the local CLI debugging experience. And so they get to the factory assembly line and everything is broken <laughs> or, or just like completely dysfunctional. Um, have an offline mode. <laughs> yeah, we forget that a lot of these factories are in uh, places too where there might not be great connectivity for you to rely on, let alone the fact that you're, you know, you're dealing with some other company's network security now and trying to get you know, your, your stuff out and how are you going to put a dedicated antenna just for you on top of their factory? It definitely is something that you do run into a lot that uh, can really throw a wrench in the works if you banked on something that you just can't do, or it's going to take you a year to, to get your manufacturer to actually take care of that. And don't forget the, uh, the problem that if you do have a wireless device in your office, maybe you have 15 working but now in manufacturing, you're building a thousand an hour and 200 of them are on at a time and they can't talk to anything because they're trashing each other's network. Um, so you, there's just all the manufacturing pieces that I've seen, I've seen that happen uh, where people suddenly have enough devices that everyone in their office has one or they're building them in manufacturing and suddenly the device no longer works. And you can't see why it's not telling you that it's broken. And the software that used to work, that sometimes works when everybody goes home, it suddenly doesn't work very often. It, it isn't consistent. It's crunchy and hard to use. Uh, and that's a manufacturing problem that comes up a lot. A bunch of engineers would have, uh, they, would, they would talk about like design for manufacturing, um, you know, which is more about like, okay, how do we actually build this thing? Um, but from the former side, I think that sometimes gets forgotten. Like um, you had mentioned, um, you know, what your manufacturing software looked like. And that's a pretty like important piece of the puzzle. And it is something firmware engineers end up doing because no one else can. I mean, who else is going to write the, oh, why don't you blink green if, all of your hardware is in place. That's not usually the manufacturing engineer's job. They're working on getting their manufacturing line to be efficient, not just to get it up for the first time. I don't actually know if it's all too common. One of the things I loved at Pebble at least is even if it was the form factor board, we still had a fixture that gave us every debugging utility that we could possibly want as if it was a development board. And so it had all the pins, had JTAG, had serial. <laughs> it behaved as if it was a normal development board, which which I know, I guess I never found the ones that fit it um, for the fixtures to allow us to do that, but cracked open a lot of watches, had to break through the glue. Thankfully we added screws later on because that was a pain. Um, 
the ability to open the board was or the the sealed unit was incredibly important <laughs> i think yeah, that oh go, go ahead, ahead philip well, i was going to i was going to take this to a slightly different direction and that you mentioned cracking open units and and figuring out what's going wrong i think another thing that um is easy to forget about is we're selling devices to customers. Some of those devices are going to break in the field or not work or have some performance characteristic that we don't understand that, that makes the experience bad. And so you do need to have a repair flow and the ability for your team to actually investigate these units and, and figure out what's going wrong. You need to be able to do all the things you might do at the factory at your office or some other place where you're performing these repairs. So you can send them back out to a, a customer or you could, you know, put it into a, a refurbished unit box that you're selling at a discount or something like that. Like that's something that is critically important. And also, you know, how are you going to handle your, your customer support um, needs? Somebody needs to be able to contact you to file an issue. You need to be able to keep track of all this stuff as it's going through the various steps in the process. Um, all of that needs to be designed and handled. Well, then usually you don't want it to be you. I mean, you're, right. you're saying like at your desk, no, really what you want is to write your documentation well enough that you don't need to be involved. That somebody else who isn't an engineer can do all of the preliminary. So you only get the interesting books. That's right. If you've done your job right. You um, mentioned something interesting there, um, Philip, about like sort of the out of box or RMA um, side of things. Um, is, that, is that something you have experience with like developing the piece of the firmware that enables that? I have used um, the same manufacturing test software to help set up a repair line um, that can be used. It's sort of like a smaller factory, essentially. So I've been involved in that process or with um, like early field FA when you're, you know, you're, you're having all the engineers look at the first hundred thousand product returns that come back in and actually do that um, triaging yourselves and trying to figure out what the, what the factory process is. So I have spent quite a lot of time dealing with that, but usually I just use the same manufacturing software um, if at all possible for that. When you're debugging the first hundred devices that come back from the field, are you just constantly updating those devices too, to like add more logs? Did you add enough to begin with? Like I'm imagining, I was never in that position, but I'm imagining at Pebble, we would just constantly update those watches like every couple hours, be like, oh, let's add a log line here. Cause you're trying to figure out how the hardware is failing. Like there probably are hardware bugs. <laughs> it, yeah, it depends, I guess, on the actual problem. I have done that. And I've also been in the case where, you know, whatever firmware we had was good enough to, to get the information. And it was clearly, mm -hmm. clearly like we had a uh, factory escape or some other issue that happened, um, you know, and, and that wasn't required, but I've definitely done both. It's a more difficult though, if you've like blown the JTAG fuses and, and you can't actually, um, you know, easily connect to the unit to debug, but that's not always the case, thankfully. Well, and sometimes those first beta units, the ones that don't usually go outside the, the building, but do go to people who aren't engineers, won't blow those fuses for that reason. Um, but once you do, it does get a lot harder to debug. And I have, in the first hundred or first thousand units out, um, if they report back to a cloud server, I have had them aggregate why they reset and then chase down the boot causes. Um, in fact, there was one in the early days of Fitbit where uh, I actually called the person and said, okay, at three o'clock, your Fitbit did some weird reboot and I don't understand. So do you know what happened? And the answer was really surprising. That was when the Fitbit went into the dryer. <laughs> Covered by warranty, right? Just RMA the unit out next time. <laughs> I mean, that was still, uh, that was still internal release, but yes, it. That, was, that was not a bug that I was gonna spend a lot of time chasing down then. Amazing. What a use case. I guess it didn't count too many steps during that. Uh, <laughs> no, actually it had. I mean, the washing cycle. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, this has been good stuff. We're talking a lot about sort of the manufacturing side of piece or even you know, the ops side of things. Um, how does that differ from what you need to have ready on the device prior to like it landing in a customer's hands rather than just hitting the manufacturing line? 
for all that we hate updating devices as customers, that has to be rock solid. Um, it That is the piece that you cannot do without. But I know you've guys already talked about OTA. What else would you answer? You'd certainly have other backend servers that need to be up and running, whether your device is checking in for remote monitoring or you have some kind of you know IoT backend that you're you're dealing with, right? That's a whole secondary software system that you're you're building um, that has to be in place and functional and tested to actually make your device work. Same with you know your your phone applications or desktop applications or your web interface, however you're um, you know engaging with with the device. Um, that needs to, to be completed and ready to go to. And I've certainly seen phone apps delay um, hardware product ship dates because firmware's ready, the product's been built and sitting in a warehouse, but we didn't finish the iOS app on time or some you know, other problem is, is gating that. Um, so all the, the various pieces that go into building and managing a fleet of devices have to be ready together to, to make that work. And then trying to find the most stable way to update. Sorry. Bless you. Thank you. Trying to find the most stable way to update the device. A Pebble, the factory firmware, the firmware that the customers receive never changed. And I think the only time, maybe it changed once, because as time went on, Android phones, some of them, some of the random ones could no longer actually do the initial firmware update on the device because their Android Bluetooth stack was actually so bad <laughs> or broken in, in weird ways that we actually had to add some workarounds to the factory firmware. But the fix for that, for those customers, I mean, we had a wide test plan, but like the fix for those customers was like, go borrow your friend's iPhone, download the Pebble app <laughs> um, or <laughs> install the firmware, which has, you know, the newest firmware has all the fixes and the workarounds that we had, but like that was truly the fix. Um, but it's like finding the way that is the most stable over time to basically reset or, or update the device is something that I never thought about either. Like the firmware is stable. It's great, but it doesn't mean the things that you connect to it are going to be stable. Yeah, that's quite challenging in these, uh, you know, fast moving IoT um, deployments. It's uh, a really good point. All right, I think we're going to move on to our first individual question. So Tyler, you're in the hot seat first. Yes. So yeah, your question is, I think you're going to like this one too. Um, so for customer support flow, how do we get enough information out of our customers to, to make your life easier, um, especially when you're wildly successful and you have thousands of devices uh, you know, hitting customers' hands? Make sure to get their phone number to, uh, to <laughs> so that you can call them if anything crazy goes on. Um, I think there's so much to touch on here. One of them, so yeah, at the very, very first thing, like beta testing with some customers that are not engineers or don't really know how to use the device, I think is incredibly important. And at that point, as long as the device is storing information on the device and you can retrieve those devices, that's probably good enough. So that you can like start debugging things. These, these beta customers are usually cheerleaders of the company. I know at Pebble, we had maybe a hundred or so trusted people who were like, sure, I'll touch a beta. I'll, I'll have a beta unit if it means I can use the product early, but their devices are crashing like constantly. And, and you know, they, they wore two watches instead of one because they, um, they would needed to have a watch that worked too. Um, but yeah, we tried to store as many logs on those devices knowing that we may replace them sooner, even if the flash chip burned out, like that's fine for us in those cases. Um, getting a way to retrieve the data off that device in some manner is also incredibly important. At, at Pebble, our flow for that, we had a mobile app which connected to the device. Our flow for that was if you clicked report a bug in the mobile app, it would then kind of pull off the logs from the device. It wasn't just an automated fashion, but it was like a, an on-demand sort of thing. And then over time, we pulled off more information from the device. We added new Bluetooth endpoints to ask the device, like, what firmware version are you running? What's, what are some metrics that are, that are key rather than just pulling off the logs? And then, of course, we built the whole system to, to pull that automatically and then automate it and, 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 and collect it all. But 
that was probably the most important thing. One, the, the report of bug flow, making sure a customer has some sort of way to pull data off the device. Two, my favorite feature was one of my favorite features of any uh, of the internal releases at Pebble was when the device crashed or experienced a known issue, we could basically pop up a banner <laughs> that told the customer, please go into the mobile app and report a bug. <clears throat> and so we could do that like in special situations, maybe we're really trying to track a hardware bug for a user. We don't wanna just collect their stuff automatically, but we're going to tell them, please file a bug. <laughs> Um, and that was good for, for the various employees at Pebble, legal team, people who didn't really know a lot about the engineering side, but they at least knew how to report a bug. Um, that was because the, the, the other company I worked for didn't have that banner. And so what actually happened was a lot of bugs just went unnoticed until a customer noticed. And so even internally, we had, you know, hundreds of employees wearing the devices. All the crashes went unnoticed because the device didn't, you know, it didn't even have a boot logo usually because it was like, oh, if you have a boot logo, then people are going to notice it's rebooting. <laughs> um, so having the banner was really good for stabilizing the firmware internally. Um, some people got really annoyed by it because they'd have to report a bug every hour, but you know, such is life. Part of what you're being paid for. <laughs> it's true. All, all I do is report bugs. You know, I, I use the I use the watch. I I, I use it in various different environments. I, I click the button mash, you know, every so often I do that before trying to force crashes. It's all actually quite fun. Yeah, nice. um, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say nice. Yeah, th those would definitely be the two, two top of my list for sure. Make it easy for people to report things. Um, and then the question you have to ask yourself is, do you leave that banner enabled for real customers? <laughs> We chose just so we, yeah, so we chose not to because we were pretty confident at that point that the device is not crashing. Like we had enough metrics, we had enough data to know we would not really ship a firmware out if it crashed less than once every seven days on average. And so that was fine. If it crashed every so often, people would notice it's crashing, but we live in the world of IoT and that's fine. Um, no one's doing mission critical stuff with their with their Pebble smartwatch at the time. Um, I want to believe that Fitbit I think was a fourteen day average before before um, shipping. I want to say it was a it was a little bit higher higher bar. Um, our clientele Pebble was hackers or, and developers, so um, they were probably fine with it. Um, but we did not leave it enabled. No, but we didn't. I mean, we of course left almost everything enabled in terms of the reporter bug collected a bunch of data from the device and then allowed engineers to, to really quickly kind of figure out the actual issue that was going on. And that was core dumps, metrics, and logs. So that was great. I think the other thing that was important at the time for Pebble, um, one thing we did kind of collect automatically was, was just raw metrics from the device, numbers, battery life, battery drain, CPU usage, LCD backlight usage, because that also played into battery, like a bunch of things around battery and, and connectivity. And the support team could pull that dashboard up and see, you know, over the last 10 days, what were the metrics on the device looking like so that they could help. So for customer support, it could help paint a picture of what was going on on the device. Um, and for engineers, we could kind of see if there was a, a, a weird regression or if the accelerometer was stuck on due to a new bug that we had never seen before, or if the Bluetooth radio was like being used a lot and that was causing the Bluetooth train. There were, there were a lot of metrics that we would keep, continue to add, I guess, firmware release by firmware release. And that was actually kind of fun to debug devices remotely in production using only numbers. You do a lot of creative things. That's great. Yeah, we could do a, certainly a whole webinar, a series of oh webinars God. probably on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, but, I do love just collecting some form of number. I think Alicia had touched on it kind of during our, even our chat before, but it's collect some vital metric or, or heartbeat or ping, or just know a device is alive and, and collect maybe a reboot reason. If that's kind of the, the minimal case, like know why the device rebooted. If the device is a rebooting due to the user shutting it down, that's one thing. But if it's due to a fault or an assert, it's another thing. Nice. Um, thank you. That's a super great answer. I, I love all of it. Um, all right. So next up, we have Phil for an individual question. So 
your question is, what are the basics that we need to think about for manufacturing tests? Yeah, it's dangerous to get me started on this topic because I could go on for a long time. Um, we, you know, we touched on manufacturing firmware. Obviously, that's essential. You know, we don't usually want to use our our customer software for manufacturing tests um, for a number of reasons. One is, you know, our customer software is often doing things autonomously or in response to events like say you're building a camera and you want to press a button and that's going to start a recording or stop a recording. That's not really behavior I want to have happen on, on the manufacturing line. So I need firmware that's not really doing anything unless it's instructed to, and it's only doing what it's instructed to. So it's, it's you know, I can get this deterministic environment to actually use for testing. And you also, you know, you need functionality that you probably don't want your customers to have. Um, access to in their firmware, whether that's just for, you know, the possibility of something going wrong or for a, you know, somebody nefarious trying to poke around your system. So you might add extra capabilities um, just for the purposes of manufacturing tests that you don't need um, in your customer firmware. And, you know, there are other things you need to think about, like um, you need usually the ability to set up the device's initial configuration and, and write all that critical information to some kind of non-volatile area in Flash. So you know your manufacturing firmware probably is going to have the smarts to unlock that region of Flash to write to it, um, but you don't want your customer firmware to have the ability to do that. So you can guarantee that you know in whatever process is happening, that region of Flash is going to stay locked and my, my factory written information will remain valid. So, you know, it's a second application you're writing, essentially. You can reuse a lot of what you're doing the, the, for your customer-facing application, but they will diverge pretty heavily at some point. Um, following that, you, you sort of need to know how to test your product, and that's unique to every product. It depends on what you're doing, how complex it is, what you need to check um, at the factory. But I find that every product has a pretty standard manufacturing flow. Um, with some base, the same basic requirements, and you can kind of build on that that basic flow. So, you know, you've manufactured some PCBs. You need to put your manufacturing software on it, right? You need to be able to um, do what we call provisioning, which is writing out critical information your your device needs. So, PCB serial numbers, final device serial numbers, MAC addresses for your radios. Uh, security keys for code signing um, or, you know, authentication with your server, whatever it might be, that information is going to be written at the factory. And so you're going to need processes for doing that. And usually that happens alongside, you know, the flashing step. You're going to want to test your PCBs to make sure that, you know, there's no um, short circuits, open connections, there's no uh, defective components before you go through all the effort of assembling that into a finished device. Um, you know, once you've assembled a, a device, you actually need to make sure that assembly went well, right? So you're going to have some tests that um, will run through all the basic functionality um, checks to make sure your assembled device works well. You might do some calibration steps. Um, you know, say you're building a camera again, right? I'm going to do some color calibration on all my cameras so that um, when I record video, I'm getting as close to the same colors out of all, all my cameras as possible. Um, and then at the end of the line, you're going to need to flash your customer software on it and potentially, you know, put your device into a, a shipping state if that's relevant. You might, for example, open a battery FET to, to make sure you're not um, losing charge while you're just sitting in a box in a warehouse. So your customer actually receives, um, you know, a, a unit that they can start using immediately. Um, so from all of that, you kind of, um, you know, if you can hit all of those steps, you've got a, a basic manufacturing process that you can incrementally build on over time. Nice. Thank you, Philip. As, as usual, very, very thorough answer. Love it. <laughs> um, one follow-up sort of question on that that I wanted to ask was um, sort of this, this out-of-box ship mode um, situation. That's Since that's part of the manufacturing test image, would you say like that in general, you would recommend like leaving your manufacturing test commands or whatever um, on the device while it's like you know, going to the warehouse, or would you say like, you know, erase that and put in some kind of alternate image? Usually the last step is to, to flash the customer firmware, which probably is not going to have those um, manufacturing interfaces on there. You That's could, you know, if you have a bootloader and you're just going to go through an OTA process anyway, you know, maybe you could skip that step. 
I don't think I've ever done that though. I think usually, you know, I, there's like a known good. We want to ship the units with this customer firmware that we've tested and make sure that we can update from, and we know it's reliable um, just as a starting point. Nice. Thank you. All right. Um, our next individual question is for Alicia. What are some strategies that can be employed to store keys, credentials securely on devices that need to connect to a network or um, send data to a server? Security. Well, I decided that I couldn't do this without slides. So I'm going to start with a, an incredibly brief introduction to public-private key encryption. And I took these images from Wikipedia. It's a great introduction, so go there. Um, but hopefully I'm just going to remind you of a few things you already know. So public-private key encryption is a really good way to start your encryption journey. And you, you decide you want to have security. So you do this key generation thing where you get a private key and a public key. Um, it doesn't matter what these are. Both are pretty valuable, although the private key is more valuable. And now if somebody wants to talk to Alice, who has the key, they take her public key and they use that to encrypt their data and they send it to Alice and Alice can use her private key to decrypt it. Note that the public key does not decrypt data. It can only encrypt data. So if you're thinking about an embedded device, this is uh, the, two, the TX line. This is the transmit line. And you're going to need another set of keys. You're going to need Bob's keys to go the other way. You can only go uh, one way per set of keys. So here we have Bob talking to Alice using Alice's public key and Alice is decrypting using her private key. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Now, oh, 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 that one. Um, so now that image with Bob's transmit is on the left. So, uh, and on the right, we have the TX and RX where Alice has her private key and Bob's public key. And Bob has Alice's public key and Bob's private key. The thing with uh, public-private key encryption like RSA is that it's a pain. It's, it's computationally intensive. It's slow, blah, blah, blah. So you don't use these when you're communicating usually. What you do is you combine them in super secret ways, possibly with some other information like the time of day. And then you have a shared secret and you use that shared secret to do some form of encryption that's much simpler. The slides are going backwards now. Uh, go down one more. So when we talk about the keys on the device, we have the device's private key and the cloud's public key. So that means the device can decrypt anything sent to it with its private key and it can encrypt anything sent to the cloud. Why are we bothering to encrypt things? And there are two main reasons for that. One, you want to make sure that the information you're getting is from who you think it is, so signatures. If, for example, Pebble want, uh, took over Fitbit's device's keys, it got these keys that live on the device, they could fake, they could spoof, um, and then get onto the Fitbit servers. And I know we're using these companies because because Tyler's been involved with them, but let's let's stick with it. Um, and then then the Pebble users can use the Fitbit apps, and Fitbit probably doesn't want to support that. So the signature piece is a big piece. And going the other way, you want to make sure that your firmware updates come from your cloud and not somebody else. Uh, and then the second thing we want to do after signatures is actual what we think of as encryption, which is protect it from anybody else reading the data. Um, if you're doing a medical device, you definitely want to stay away from HIPAA and all of the things involved with keeping uh, patient data private. And Fitbit did this too because patient data such as exercise habits should be kept private. So. We have signatures and encryption for our public private key thing that shares the secret so they can talk to each other via simpler mechanisms. Where do you put these? Philip mentioned that for, you probably want to put them in, in manufacturing. 
and you probably need a serial number to go with them. Okay, so we have a serial number, we have some keys, we compile them into the code, I'll be fine. If we ever need to update them, we'll do the OTA and update them that way. Well, what if, and hear me out here, what if some bad person, attacker, script kitty, some interested party, a reverse engineer, hacker, whatever, they say, this is a really interesting application. I want to know more. Well, no device is perfectly secure once people have physical access. Whether it's uh, sanding down the chip to read out the code or figuring out that there's a secret debug serial port or forgetting to blow the flash fuses so that people can read your code out with the right tools, it doesn't matter. What you need is to make the process of breaking your code more expensive uh, than anybody wants to pay for it. That doesn't get you away from things like script kitties who do it for amusement, but it does make it so that you're not professionally attacked. So the the amount of in, the amount of effort you put into this, and it's continuing effort. It's not just once. <laughs> should be a, a reflection of how much money your company will lose if the data goes public. Okay, so back, you can compile them into the code and somebody can then crack them. Well, now they have keys to everything. I mean, they, they can send data as a device. So you say, okay, I don't want it to be that simple. Uh, in manufacturing, I'm going to put them on an external spy flash. Okay, well then you get people like me who can read your spy flash as soon as they have a board. Um, Okay, I'll put it on the internal flash. Okay, that, that's not bad. And some chips have, have features that make that very difficult to read. Most of them are imperfect. Um, but then you get things like the chip whisperer that does magical things that will tell you these things just by sitting next to it. There are external crypto chips. The choice you make here is really about what you need to do as a company um, for security things. So the next slide. Let's say they get broken. Um, and if you are using the same key for every device, all devices now are broken. But instead, you can do a per keying device, per, per device keying, sorry, per device keying. And that is far more secure. It means that every device has their own set of keys. Um, if you break the keys, for that device, you can only spoof that device. Um, you can't read traffic for other devices or from other devices. Except that is a huge pain. I mean, you talk about manufacturing software. Every unit now has a serial number and its private key. And if you're really being fancy, maybe it has a cloud's public key as well, an individualized cloud's public key. And that will let you Make sure that if anybody cracks a device, they only get that device. They can't build a whole army of new pebbles invading Fitbit servers. Uh, one more slide. Uh, the other side of this equation are the keys that live in the cloud. Whether you do each device has its own key or in each device has its own private and public key from the cloud, doesn't matter. These are secret. These are very secret. Once people have these, they can pretend to be your cloud. They can take your devices, they can take your firmware, they can do anything they want. This isn't the sort of thing you leave in your office drawer. This is the sort of thing that should be in a safe. And yet, we need them to actually do our work. We can't talk to the devices without them. And this isn't necessarily part of the discussion. It's just really important to understand that all of the security stuff, the easiest way to break it is people. And so you need to keep them locked and don't check them into GitHub. I know you forgot that one time. Now you have to change all of them. Um, so yeah, be aware of how the security is going to affect your manufacturing because it will. 
And whether it's just you protecting your company, protecting your customers, protecting your trademarks, all of the stuff is part of the manufacturing process that you shouldn't wait until the end to think of. Okay, I'm sorry, that was a little more prepared than you probably wanted. But what do you think, Philip? Well, I have a question. Um, to me, it seems like the most challenging part of what you described would actually be getting the, how do I exchange data with my CM? And how do I prevent my CM from having access to all my keys? Especially given the fact that we talked about, um, we don't often have network connectivity between our CM site and our, our office. Um, so how do you typically manage that? Um, the companies who have the most to lose, uh, people who necess who may have military contracts or um, HIPAA violation issues, end up doing their final manufacturing in mm -hmm. wherever domestic is. So right. if it's in the U.S., they do it here, uh, and that's that means the unit gets almost fully manufactured. May even be in its case, or may even be in its packaging. And then that last bit happens in the company. Uh, as for not having connection, well, you don't actually need to. You, you can send a database of keys over and then they get programmed in. The manufacturer says, we're done with these keys. You load them to your cloud and it just goes in that sort of cycle. And you just sent them half the dump. You didn't send them all the information. Right. right. I mean, that's the beauty of the pri the public keys is that you don't, everybody can actually know the public keys. Mm -hmm. You don't really want to spread them around, but it is possible. Uh, so yeah, you don't have to send them everything. You can also have devices that will find their own private keys. Send your, the device itself will tell the CM what its public key is. And the CM knows the public key for the, the cloud. So nobody but the device ever knows its private key. Um, and that's kind of mentally challenging that your device is going to go out and make its own security, but it's one of the best ways to do it. Thanks. That was that was a great answer. And I just want to underscore um you know, for the topic of this panel, this is clearly not something you can cowboy at the last minute, right? A lot of thought has to go into how you're securing your devices and managing that. And um, this is the kind of thing that if you wait until the last minute to think about it and do it, you're not gonna do it well, or you're going to delay the ship date of your product, right? So um, as we see security regulation coming down upon us, it's certainly something you can't ignore. But do look to your chip vendors. Like OTA, a lot of these things are becoming more standard and becoming less of something you need to do yourself. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, buy off the shelf. Someone solved this problem. <laughs> we should do a webinar on security. I'm realizing that <laughs> that'll be something. TBD. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Alicia. That was an amazing, amazing answer. Um, all right. So next up, we've got a group question for the panel. So that's going to be um, sort of more of a broad one, but what we really want to see is any common pitfalls or um, you know hurdles that you see um, in general when you know shipping IoT devices when you're shipping these products out. Bricks, bricks are the most fun. Uh, where you you mess up OTA and suddenly maybe the manufacturer has built a thousand of these and the OTA doesn't work. So they're all just trash unless you unbox them. Um, that's that's heartbreaking. There is somewhere in a factory in China, a crate of 5,000 iPhones that it was my fault for bricking. <laughs> We're just never <laughs> dealt with. So yeah, it's painful. Let's see, 5,000 times, how much does an iPhone cost? Yeah, I haven't done this math. <laughs> I don't think it would be my most expensive uh, mistake, though. I will say that I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is the fact that we have to interface between um, 
software teams and hardware teams who have totally different jobs. And what you often see with embedded devices is that orgs are going to be dominated by one or the other, right? You're going to have your um, head of whatever you call it for the, the device itself is going to be a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer who's going to be focused on the physical side, or you're going to have somebody who comes from a software background and they have this great idea that requires a product, but they have no idea what it takes to build a product. And when you're in these situations, and for example, you're really an expert in hardware, but you have no idea of all the external software pieces that are required to make your device function, you're just not going to think about it. It's not going to be in your schedule. It's going to be a surprise. You're going to have continual slips as you, you learn this and then vice versa, right? You're, if you're a software person, you don't realize that you need to get your FCC certification and your Bluetooth radio has to be certified because you didn't pick a pre-certified module or, you know, you forget that you actually need to figure out how to provision all this information at a factory, right? That's, it's the same thing. You're just going to not know what you have to do and, and you're going to be surprised. And that's going to be very, very painful when you have months of delays because of these critical pieces that you can't overlook and you, you can't just kind of shoehorn in at the last minute. I've definitely used the uh, smart device that has the same name for every single device in the Bluetooth pairing screen. And then you have to literally like walk <laughs> down the street to pair the thing and then you walk back. We also had that at Pebble one time. That was fun. <laughs> <clears throat> I think one of the one of the things that it may honestly maybe Noah, you remember this shipping on our devices. We were just displeased with how slow we were provisioning data and running manufacturing tests. And so one guy, one firmware engineer, his full time job for like one or two months was building a web application that talked locally to a fleet or like a farm of Raspberry Pis that would then run the manufacturing tests. And it was just like totally out of the blue, it was not what he was planning on doing. <laughs> um, and yeah, but it was like because we couldn't literally produce enough of these devices quickly enough if we had just run the normal manufacturing line we had to have this like automated system that was honestly like a huge project yeah those types of things are very sneaky like you don't think about okay it takes me you know 45 seconds to generate a private key on the device and get the flash set up and then put it into ship mode whatever that's 45 and i seconds. need a million of these by black friday you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> then the time you can't even do that for <laughs> Yeah, that's something I really appreciate from working at Apple. Um, I don't remember the UPH we had to hit, but I think it was something like a million. So uh, time was very important because, you know, you can't fill a factory floor with just one test station. And there were hundreds. On hardware stage rollout. Yeah. I think, you know, on the manufacturing front and the speed front, something that I see a lot is people forget about uh, manufacturing tests between development builds. And so you, you go to a build event for your, you know, you're producing engineering prototypes, you create your manufacturing tests, you, um, you know, your firmware does some things and then you're back in the office. It's in between events. You're changing your firmware, you're adding new features, you're rewriting commands, things like that. And then you go to, to build more units and you've changed everything. So your firmware doesn't work or your, or your firmware and your test scripts are incompatible. And now there's a last minute scramble to get those up to date. And you haven't been validating your manufacturing firmware in between builds. So now there's bugs and your retest rate is high, which is you know, causing you to spend twice the amount of time to get units through the production line. Um, you can't just ignore manufacturing firmware if you're not doing a build event. It needs to be something that you include in your CI pipelines that you're, you know, it, and in fact, on that point, it's a very easy way to get into hardware in the loop testing and, and automation because you could, for example, in every build flash a little, uh, a couple devices, maybe hooked up to a tester or even just running the commands and make sure that your manufacturing test scripts still work, they execute in the expected amount of time, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to do that validation anyway, right? You can't just release, like you can't release buggy, crashy builds to customers. You can't release buggy, crashy builds to your factory either. Um, so it's something to, to keep in mind because I see that happen a lot that people just forget about them. How many firmware builds do you typically have throughout the whole process? Do you have 
a release, a debug, manufacturing, uh, inbox firmware. Like it's almost four different ones. Do you count bootloader as a different one? Depends on if the bootloader is a micro image or not. But I would like the full fledged image. I think I probably had four. Yeah, I would say three to four is pretty common. Dang. Yeah. It can get more complicated, I guess, if you're changing your keying strategy based on whether you're a development unit or a production unit too, or you know any other details. Like if you have a, a totally separate development backend environment, which you should, um, yeah. then you know you might hard code things, or depending on how you're handling that, you might now multiply your configs, um, which points out that that stuff should probably be configurable information on your device and not a variant if you could help it. And that's often something that you learn the hard way as you're realizing. <laughs> yeah, let's do development and testing and debugging on our production backend. It doesn't uh, usually work out very well. <laughs> Something's going to break inevitably. <laughs> awesome. Um, that was great. Thank you guys very much. Um, I think we're going to jump into a few audience questions now, unless anyone else had some more items they wanted to talk about for the common hurdles section. Let's do questions. All right, awesome. Um, yeah, so we got some great questions coming in, and please keep keep sending them in for any of the attendees. Um, yeah, we'll happily answer any, any we can. Um, the first one that I'd like to ask the panel is, um, what is the best way to secure a UART or a programming interface? Um, you know, certainly one common password is not good enough. Um, and if you disable it, then you're unable to you know, debug a sealed unit. So what are strategies that you might use for that? I'm going to pass on this question. We use a hard coded <laughs> thing at Pebble. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think there's a balance between Going back to what Alicia said, you know, if somebody has your device, there's a limit to what you can secure. So commonly I do see a hard coded password. You know, if it's beyond that, it would be um, you need to authenticate with some kind of key over a special Bluetooth connection endpoint or something like that. Um, I, I've done that in the past. I've seen strategies where um, you might have a, a special debug board you plug in that has to send a password and like toggle some IO lines in a specific sequence with like very precise timing. But again, these are all things that can be totally reverse engineered from your firmware um, and, and used against you um, if you're really concerned about that. Um, blowing fuses and just eliminating your debug interfaces altogether is, you know, but then you can't deal with Don't even say that after the fact. I'm, don't say that, Philip. No. <laughs> Keep it, I, again, it depends on the degree of concern you have and how how much you really need to protect that. Uh, another one I see a lot is your debug interface is only available for a short time. So you have mm. to type that password in in the first two seconds after booting, which if you know the password is easy, but if you don't, it's hard to start guessing if you have to wait for a reboot each time. Yeah, I've definitely seen that strategy used. All right, another question from the audience we have is, um, how do you manage revocation of keys for critical devices? That's probably a whole paper. I was thinking. One yeah. <laughs> I have not written. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is a hard problem. Um, it isn't so much revoking the keys, it's replacing them. Because you can't, I mean, if you want to just trash a bunch of units so they can't get to your cloud because they've fallen off a truck or something, that's one thing. You just delete them from your access list. Uh, but if you have devices you think may have been uh, accessed improperly, then you probably, just sending them new keys isn't going to help because if they have your device, then sending them a new key isn't, doesn't do much. You just give them the new key. Uh, so there isn't really a good solution that I know of. I would be happy to be wrong if anybody else has a good solution. So I don't know how it's done, but I know from um, 
just watching security news. For example, MSI just had their um, BIOS updating keys leaked in a ransomware attack, and they don't have a revocation mechanism for um, making so those keys can't be used anymore. But apparently other uh, motherboard manufacturers have solved this problem. So I'd be really curious how um, you know, various vendors like that handle revocation of the, the UEFI um, keys for their secure boot processes. And maybe that would be a good model. But I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know how that's done at all. Got it. So in the case where it would be needed, it's probably like a whole, <laughs> a whole month long project for someone, multiple months probably. Right. Um, we got a good one here. Can you talk more about bootloader design and the concept of a micro image? Um, I think Tyler, maybe you mentioned that one. Yeah, there is a, a webinar done by Francois, who basically I think iterated through a bunch of designs from his time at Pebble and then at, at, at Oculus. <clears throat> but I guess the idea is, so one, look at the webinar. It was given by, by a, an engineer for engineers, not pitching them fault really, um, but kind of talked about the multi-stage bootloader design. But in, in short, it's like the tiniest little bootloader that knows where to look for the bootloader image so that you can update the bootloader image. But then the bootloader is only responsible for kind of verifying the new firmware image, making sure it's signed, and then knowing how to actually boot it and knowing if you have two slots or knowing how to update the main image. Um, I have seen both types of bootloaders that one can connect to Bluetooth or like have some sort of connectivity stack and then others that do not. What I, what I typically work with is the bootloader itself does not have connectivity. There's usually a, what did, what did we call it? A recovery firmware and then a main firmware. The recovery firmware is like a full-fledged image that has a UI, it has a lot of stuff. And then that's the thing that has the connectivity. Um, and then there's the full image that has everything. Um, but it's like, you're booting through stages and at each time you're, you're verifying and you're seeing if you need to update the thing. And you're basically performing like hardware validation across um, as you boot through. I'm, I'm sure Philip or Alicia have extra things to add there, but. I would say watch the webinar. Yeah, I thought that was a good answer. Nice. Um, another great question we have. Um, actually, we're at the top of the hour, but we'll, we'll do one more question, and I think we'll close out the panel um, and answer the rest of the interrupt Slack. Um, but this last question that we'll do live um, from, do you worry about security with the ability to crack open a release product? Sure. I mean, it's about it's about how concerned you are. Um, it's not easy. It's not usually, and people don't, people are usually buying your product because they want the product. Um, it's when you have things that your product can cause other problems, uh, medical devices or uh, locating people that's when you start worrying about where, how you're doing the security. But again, if you have one unit, you should only be able to break that one unit. If you can break all the units by cracking open one, then you have a much bigger problem. And there are strategies you can take should your device warrant such strategies. You know, you can create a circuit that is only closed, for example, when your product is fully enclosed and the circuit is broken when it's open, um, you know, you can use that to um, control behaviors. Obviously that can be faked. Um, there's also things like a lot of RTC components will have tamper alarms that can be used to trigger a wake up event. And so you can leverage things like this if you are really concerned to, for example, uh, self-brick a unit. You know, it's not really something that you want to do, but if your security warrants such a, a degree or such a, you know, a concern or consideration that you might really want to, to take catastrophic extreme measures if somebody's opening your device, there are ways to detect that that's happening and respond to it. You have to be prepared to do an RMA in case something goes wrong, um, you know, or, or have some way, to, some flow in place that you could repair those units and, and make them good again if it was an accident or some other thing happened, but um, you definitely can detect those 
you know, devices being cracked open. I've actually worked on one that self-bricked. And the hardest part for me was at the end when we really had to test this functionality, but we were still in engineering. So we didn't have that many prototypes, but you have to test the functionality. You have to make sure it bricks. And for us, it was, it? oh, we uh, updated, we put a bootloader into RAM and then updated the flash to be all ones and then all zeros and then all ones. Yep. Um, yeah. And there was, it, we didn't have a recovery method and it was a unit that we had uh, uh, taken out the flash fuses because it was supposed to be very secure. So it's truly bricking the unit. There is no recovery. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to do that to the unit that you've had lovingly sitting on your desk. You know, it's been your friend through all of these debugging adventures and now you're just going to kill it. Sometimes that's a lot of money, you know, depending on the cost to build those prototypes, that's just, you know, thousands of dollars that can be just flushed down the drain to test this functionality. Thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours. Yes, it's just hard to watch, harder to do. But sometimes necessary, but heartbreaking nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm just going to share the panelists' information really quick. All right. Um, yeah, so big thank you to our panelists today. Um, that was amazing, especially um, our special guest, Alicia White. Um, th so thank you guys so much for entertaining our questions. Uh, it was a ton of fun. I could go for hours. Um, you can see on the slide, and we'll share this uh, as part of the webinar follow-up, there's contact information for all these nice folks, um, especially a big shout out to Embedded FM and the Embedded, um, Embedded Artistry content that those two guys uh, put out, which is like just amazing stuff. So please go check it out. Thank um, you. And thank you. Big thank you as well to all the um, attendees. Thank you for uh, joining us while we discuss this topic and looking forward to the next one. Thank Bye, you. Bro.